right. Praise God. <clears throat> I'll give it a few minutes, a few, a uh, little bit of time here for people to get on. It is Thursday, January the 28th, Thursday night at 7 p.m. And uh, tonight I plan on talking on the church restoration, on church restoration. So I'll give people a few minutes to... <clears throat> to uh, log on with us. Hello. Hello. All right. Hello, Brother Dobson. I'm just giving it a minute or two and let letting people get on. People are they're not not connected yet. Well, of course, it's just 702, Brother Doc, brother, brother Keith, but <clears throat> so far, it's just me and you, unless sometimes people get on and they don't, they don't show that they're on. So, um, I'll give it just a minute here. All right, well, Sister Durham, I think people are just now starting to get on. So you're not really too late. Anyway, um, I wanna welcome everybody. I said earlier, it's January the 28th, Thursday night at uh, 7 p.m. I think right now it's about 7.03. Anyway, so we want to uh, start our Bible study. I don't know how, I don't know if somebody can tell me, can you get on here and I not know you're on here? I do. You, I think you have to comment or something for me to see you on here, don't, don't you? Or is that not true? <clears throat> anyway, hi, Sister Julie. We missed you, Sunday. Hi, Sister Sandra. Uh, Brother Roy Durham, Sister Durham. Uh, Brother Phil. Uh, I I talked on this one one time, but I don't know if I gave it as you know. Uh, probably maybe was not as uh, thorough. But anyway, I want to go through. Uh, types of the church in restoration uh, as well as its phases and um, um, <clears throat> before I do I will, I will mention a scripture in uh, Job 28 and verse 28 Job said <clears throat> Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. 
and do, to depart from evil is understanding. So, um, you know, what Job was saying here was is to um, that the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To have the fear and reverence for God in our lives that he is to be the focus for our life and purpose here on earth, that's wisdom. And then that helps you to know the reason and understand the reason to depart from evil because you know his purpose is to develop you in righteousness. And so I was telling the brethren in the Dominican Republic earlier today that <clears throat> um, I was telling, I was talking to him a little bit about principles. Principles is uh, the, the, the governing uh, factor are governing the governing principles are the uh, you might say the rules are the rudiments the the very beginning of God's working in our lives those rules are are absolutely necessary those principles are necessary. But I have said, <clears throat> I've been working on this lately, and I've been saying that those rules without understanding. I had one time a sister in my church that she told me that her one of her children asked her, why do we do this? Whatever it was, I don't know if it was a dress standard or if it was, you know, some order that we were keeping. I don't know what her, I don't remember what the question was, but her answer was, is because I asked her, I said, well, what did you tell her? She said, I told her it's because that's what Brother Smith teaches. And I said, that's not an answer. See, <clears throat> an answer, a rule or a principle without understanding won't accomplish anything. <laughs> By the way, Brother Wright, Ronald Wright in Washington, hello. It's good to have you. And I want to thank you for the missionary offering. We received it in today's mail. Thank you very much, Brother. You don't know how much all of the, everyone chipping in helps and it helps us get through, especially Right now, with COVID over in the Dominican Republic, they're they're suffering. A lot of people were without work, and so I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Um. Anyway, brother Fidel, good to have you with us. Uh, La Jali Ali. That is, I believe, Sister Brother Emilio Green's niece in the Dominican Republic. I believe I'm right about that. Anyway, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, <clears throat> let me get back to these principles. <laughs> See, principles are very necessary, but understanding the purpose of principles, because if a person lives by a standard of life, whether it's a dress standard or whether it's a standard of uh, a standard of obedience or a standard of behavior, you know, uh, we have to under, have the understanding of what that principle is for. And if you just live hope, keeping rules and and if you um, if you equate that to being your righteousness, you, you're missing it. Because 
righteousness has to become a part of your character. The standard or principle is to help you keep your flesh under uh, control, that you're holding your flesh, uh, your, your mind, your fleshly ideas, your body, your spirit, you're, you're holding those things um, in line with these principles so that God can work in your life while you're obtaining the understanding and the wisdom of God. And so you can't, you know, finally, these principles will become a part of your character. They're no longer principles. You've left principles. What did, what did Paul say in, in Hebrews 6? Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection. You got to leave the principles of, of, of the beginnings, the, the, the beginning the rudiments of teachings, uh, and the, the, but eventually they're to become a part of our our character. A, rule, a, a principle will never help you to become a full age or a perfect, but you have to have them. Uh, you've got to have rules and, and principles, principle teachings that hold you in place when God's working on your life. Anyway, I'm just throwing that in tonight as a as a starter. Uh, but what I do want to talk to you about, um, I want to talk to you about. Uh, let me see. Um, I want to talk to you about the phases of restoration, the church in in restoration, and uh, I want to give you several things that will help us uh, to understand the church in restoration. So I'm gonna give you some, some scriptures and some types that are very beautiful types that helps us to understand God's restoring of the church in the Gentile times. Um, I might say, uh, I, I, I want to get through this, so, but I just might say, you know, that I've I've said it many times. If you don't understand that the church fell away and went into darkness, and that it and the need for restoration, you you will not understand the um, the purpose and plan of God, especially for the Gentile world. Hello, Brother Rivera. God bless your heart. It's good to have you with us. Um, anyway, so so I want to give you these. Um, I want to give you these types, and and I want to tie them together to show the restoration. The first thing I want you to do is go to um, uh, Genesis, the twenty sixth chapter. And I know you've heard these before, but I do want to tie them together for you. Uh, the first thing you need to know in, in Genesis 26, it starts off, and this is talking about Isaac. Uh, it says in verse one, there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went into Abimelech, unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines under Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land and I'll bless, I, will, I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed I'll give all the countries and I'll perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham, my father. Well, <clears throat> when, you, when you look at the type here, what happened was is uh, he became, you know, uh, uh, so 
you know, he, he got in trouble with Abimelech. By the way, Abimelech is a, is a, it's a kingly title. It's not a name. It's like Pharaoh, for an example, in Egypt. <clears throat> so here, here in, in, this was uh, in, uh, in Canaan, just the outskirts of Canaan where these Philistines had, uh, had developed uh, their setting. Uh, and so Isaac, he, he, he got in trouble with Abimelech because he, he did the same thing his father did. And he was worried because his wife was so pretty. He, he told him that was his sister. And of course, uh, Abimelech saw him sporting with his wife and, and, uh, he knew then that that was, that wasn't his sister. And so he told him, he said, you know, uh, you could have you could have got us in a lot of trouble with God by telling us that some somebody may have took your wife, and so he said, if anybody touches this man or his wife, <clears throat> um, uh, how do you say that he'll be put to death? And so Isaac. <clears throat> He sowed in the land and he received, the Bible said, the same year, a hundredfold. And <clears throat> um, he, he became, he was so great that they asked him to, to go out away from them. And so <clears throat> he pitched in the, he left thou there and he went to the valley of Gerar and he dwelt there. And so he did, he, he dug again the wells of water, which had been digged in the days of Abraham, but the Philistines had stopped them up. Um, you know, if you read into it, they, they either put stones and, you know, earth and anything they could to go down in those wells to stop them up. They even, they even put, they killed animals and put in there to poison the water, to, you know, to, to run the water. <coughs> in some of those places. But anyway, uh, Isaac's servants digged. Uh, he did, they dug in the valley and they, they, they went to redig those wells. Uh, anyway, the herdsmen of Gerar strove with Isaac's herdsmen saying, this water's out. And he called the name of the well Esek. Uh, and I'm giving you this as a type of, of, of church restoration. <clears throat> remember I'll say something more about it but remember the Lord told him that he would perform an oath with him if they'd stay there in that country and not go into Egypt you know that that uh, that's a picture that you know God when God puts us where he wants us we're to stay there and <clears throat> labor and God will bless us and uh, anyway, they dug this well, and that first well named Esek meant, that word means strife, Esek. And that's a picture of the Protestant movement of God starting the Reformation. If you were, you know, uh, God, God started all over with Gentiles <clears throat> after he harvested the Jewish world. He started all over with these Gentiles and a new world. And he had to start with them on a more of a primitive level because they didn't have the platform the Jews had that God had been working with them for over 2,000 years or up to 2,000 years. The Gentiles didn't have that. When God finished his harvest, he started a new harvest. And God started with a new world of the Gentiles, even though there was it was opened up to the Gentiles in the, in the Jewish uh, harvest uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, first with Peter and, um, and then <clears throat> with, uh, with Paul, the apostle Paul being the Gentiles, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, started off with Peter with Corne the house of Cornelius, a Gentile. And he opened it up, but 
there, those people, those were the early Gentiles that came in and the apostle Paul began to take the message to the Gentiles. But God started off with them. And like I said, in a more of a primitive uh, platform, if you remember the, the question that Paul took to Jerusalem in the 15th chapter, the, the meeting that the ministry had there together uh, concerning whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised. They, they disregarded that. They wrote a question. I mean, they wrote a letter to the Gentiles and said that they weren't to eat anything strangled. They weren't to have anything to do with idols. <clears throat> they just, it was a very small, um, uh, uh, a group of people. And, um, so, uh, Uh, um, among among the Gentiles that first came in. And then those that Paul began to take this to, that was just the early beginnings of Gentiles. As all Gentile nations begin to en encompass the word of God, <clears throat> you know, their minds tried to put all this together. That's why by the time the Catholic Church in AD 325, um, uh, tried to uh, control religion of Christianity. That's why they missed it a long ways from what the early church had. That God, that's what God had to deal with and work with. And finally, he developed men out of that. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, in Haverhill, jo Sister Jolly, Holly. Okay, so uh, finally, God was able to bring men like Huss and Wycliffe, men out of uh, the Catholic Church, uh, Martin Luther. He was a monk in the Catholic Church. And uh, God began to give those men some revelation that finally was, he was able to move them outside of Catholicism and start the Reformation, which we call today Protestantism. It was called Protestantism because they were literally protesting against the Catholic Church, realizing where they had missed it and what God was revealing. And so that started the Protestant movement. And But that was this first well ESEC because they strove, they were, they, they, the, they were strove against, they were looked down upon, um, and they were claiming, you know, this is a universal church. You can't move outside of it. This is ours. Well, so they digged another one. And they called the name of it Sitna. And that word Sitna, it also means to strive or contention. And that's a picture of, of uh, the Pentecostal movement. Uh, the Pentecostal movement was further, God further restoring, working on restoring his church, getting us back. We've often said that the early church came out, the, the, uh, they came in the front door and went out the back door and we're going back in the back door to get, you know, to get to the beginning of what uh, the early church had. So, the Pentecostal movement was the second phase of God's uh, restoration work of restoring his church that finally brought us to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Pentecostal movement. Brother William Souders always taught that the, uh, the Pentecostal group of people uh, you know, he, he taught that the baptism of the Holy Ghost took place in the labor. And that's when God began to reveal more truths in the labor. I'll explain more about that in a little while. But anyway, they were, they were striven with there. You know, the, this body, the body of Jesus Christ, uh, you know, 
there there was still contention and striving over the organizations of the Pentecostal era. Uh, finally, Brother Souders got a revelation of uh, uh, of something greater being the body of Christ. But it, but at first, this body was a work uh, of the Pentecostal movement. And, uh, and then, but when they went, they went and dug another well, that well is Rehoboth. That, that means, uh, how did he say it there? The Lord appeared to them the same night, the same month, apply this. Uh, he, there he is. From now the Lord hath made room for us. And we shall be fruitful and land. He went up from thence to Beersheba. Once they were given that well. They were left alone there for a period of time, and uh, they were given room. And that's a picture. That's a picture of the body of Christ that we uh, finally have, are reaching a place that where we are giving room. In fact, I've said that we have left. We finally are no longer a part of the Pentecostal movement. But this body is left outside of just the Pentecostal movement. Uh, and, uh, and I think that is where this well really is, that God has finally given us room. And then uh, Abimelech uh, went to, I'm going to read in the 26th verse, Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahazoth, one of his friends and Fickal, the chief captain of the army, and Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing you hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We certainly, uh, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee, and we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou shalt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee. And as we have done unto thee nothing but good and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Well, anyway, they then they finally dig. Verse 32 said, and it came to pass on the same day the Isaac servants came to him, servants came to him and told him concerning the well which they had digged and said unto him, we have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. That word Sheba means an oath. Uh, there, uh, God told him that he would make an oath with him. If he would stay there, God would bless him. And that's a picture. That, that picture is, that's a picture of the restored church. This oath, and matter of fact, I would even mention Paul's stating of the two immutable things in the book of Hebrews uh, that uh, uh, where God had taken made an oath with Abraham concerning the promised child of Isaac and the the uh, covenant that he made there with him which was a picture, the, that oath was a picture of the promised child or Jesus Christ coming to this world. And then he also made an oath, the other immutable thing that uh, that's certain that God can't lie. That uh, was his oath uh, unto his son, Jesus Christ, that he would be a a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and so uh, this is this is a type of these these phases of restoration of Protestantism, Pentecostalism, then the body of Christ. Uh, I will say, uh, I, I'll, I'll explain it later in this in another type, but it's thirty years before the last prophetical hour is when that uh, 
when Rehoboth actually uh, the type of was the type of Rehoboth. Now let me give you um, Zechariah. I'm going to give you in the book of Zechariah the first chapter. Okay, I believe it starts maybe in the 18th verse. Okay, <clears throat> Zechariah said, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered to me, These are the horns which have scattered Jeru Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Uh, and the Lord showed me four carpenters. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. These four horns are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Those are the the heads of the dragon that scattered, you know, the Gentile. We're talking about the the, the Gentile world that, that, in other words, it came down. This was a scattering of Israel and all the way down to the Gentiles in with Rome. And those are the four horns that scattered God's people. But these four carpenters, these four carpenters, are to restore what these horns have scattered. And those four, heart, those four are the same thing. These four horns are the same as the four worms in Joel, the first chapter. Joel, the first chapter, uh, if you want to go there, uh, let's see right quick, Joel 1. <clears throat> Um, he said, the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, hear this, you old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even the days of your fathers? Tell it to your children. Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children, their children, another generation. That which the palmer worm, those are the same as the horns in Zechariah. That, that the palmer worm had left, the locust has eaten. Babylon, Medo-Persia, that that the locust is left, the canker worm has eaten, Greek, uh, let's see, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then what the canker worm left, the caterpillar, Rome, has eaten. Those are the same as those four horns in Zechariah. And then those four carpenters are, the, that is, uh, Protestantism, it's Pentecostalism. It, this, this is the restoring work of God, his four carpenters. Those, uh, those four carpenters, the other type I'll give you is in uh, the, let me, let me give you before I give you the four carpenters or the four angels in, in the, loosed out of the river Euphrates in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation. Let's go to um, 2 Peter, the first chapter. <clears throat> these, I think it's important for you to understand uh, all of these things that are beautiful types in the Bible. Um, and here in the first chapter of the book of a uh, second letter of, of Peter, second Peter two. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, second Peter, the first chapter. And um, let's start in verse four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises by these that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Here, <clears throat> God has given us precious promises that we might be partakers of the divine nature. 
That's what we're all striving for. We are all striving <clears throat> uh, to escape the corruption that's in the world through lust and be a partaker of God's uh, divine nature. And so here I'm going to give you, this is also fits right in the restoration. Besides this, verse five, giving diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, let's go back and look at the, each one of those. Okay, when the, the, the gate, if we look at the, in the, the, the type inside the tabernacle, you get in the tabernacle through the gate. And for us to get in the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> the work that's in the temple or the tabernacle, you got to go through the gate. And that gate is a gate of faith. <clears throat> that was established. Uh, Martin Luther is the one, his message began, he began with the message out of Habakkuk that the just shall live by faith. They don't live by rules. They don't live by uh, uh, saying Hail Marys and our fathers and paying penance to the church. But he, he began to realize that we've got to have a we got to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he did on the cross for us as an example and the life that we are to live in faith. You know, there is one faith. That faith is not just talking about believing, but it's believing the word of God, the life of Christ and his teachings. And so he began to teach on faith. That was the gate. Uh, and then add to your faith, Peter said, virtue. Virtue is a, <clears throat> that, word, that word virtue is, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, a moral excellence, but it's also strength and power. Remember Jesus, when he, uh, the little woman with an issue of blood, when she pressed through the crowd and touched his garment, he turned around and said, I felt virtue go out of me. He felt power and strength. Well, add to your faith virtue. Uh, John Wesley, John and Charles Wesley, which that's their teaching started the, the Methodist movement uh, used to be called the Wesleyan movement. They taught uh, sanctification, that you, you can't just have faith. You've got to have, uh, you've got to have, you, you got to come out from the ways of the world and be ye separate. And uh, you've got to, you got to live a sanctified, set apart life, call for the work of God, as I said in the beginning of Job 28, 28, when Job said, fear God, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. When you fear God and you, you, begin, you begin to awe and recognize God's purpose, and that's the focus of your life, to, to have God in focus and his purpose. For your for creation and you being in it, his calling on your life. That's wisdom. When you realize that about God, and that becomes your focus, and then at which causes you to have the understanding of why it's necessary to put evil out of your life, to depart from evil. That takes God's help. Well, that's what sanctification is. When you add to your faith virtue and those two things, faith and virtue is, that is, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, faith is the gate and virtue is the altar. Those two things is the Protestant movement. Those were established 
even though Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the Wittenberg, Germany cathedral door, a tabernacle door there in 1517, I believe it was, um, it wasn't established until 1543 that the Protestant movement was actually established in full swing. And the reason I say that because Martin Luther's message and his work began to be sown uh, in that world in, in, uh, in the 1500s. But it wasn't until 1539 when King Henry VIII declared himself, he pulled away from the Catholic Church and declared himself the head of the church in 1539. Well, the Catholic Church had had little risings up of countries that done things like that, pulled away from them, but they would just wait till they would get, you know, something would happen to give them uh, a chance to flex their power and bring, the, bring that little nation down. But when Britain pulled out, that, that was something much bigger. And by, by 1543, they, the Catholic Church began to realize we got a problem. And so they started the anti-Reformation movement in 1543 with the Jesuit priesthood. That's why I say Protestantism was established in 1543. Um, and I'll tell you why I use that date here a little later. Okay, and then add to your virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And that's where I say we have been in the body of Christ. We have been, that's in the labor, which is where Brother Souders taught. That's where you receive the Holy Ghost. It's the washing of the water by the word. The, the, the water is the spirit of God. The Holy Ghost will cleanse you and begin to touch you. I've often said when the, when the, when God when the Spirit of God touches your life, the Holy Ghost anointing through an anointed ministry, when the, when the words of an anointed minister, God uses that anointing to touch you as an individual and faith. The Bible said, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, it takes the anointed word of God or it's just, it's just, this, the, this, what does it say? The letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. When you hear an anointed word of God and God anoints you, he, the spirit touches you, that'll cause faith to rise in your heart. Well, then once you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the Pentecostal era, that's when God began to reveal more primarily through the work of Brother William Souders. The body of Christ and Brother Souders is calling and work. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the center or the core of what God was working on in the restoration of the church was restoring the revelation of the body of Jesus Christ. The, the restoring, the understanding of one body, one faith, one baptism, one Father, who's above all now, one Lord, one Father, one Spirit. So uh, that that was the that was the labor, and there's where we receive knowledge, temperance, and patience. I don't think too much of the Pentecostal world got near as much out of it as what God was working on the core of the work of the body of Christ. He's given us knowledge, and then he's tempered us in this knowledge. God has, we went through the fire. We've had to be tempered in the knowledge that God gave us. We've had threshing, threshing floors that's caused us to have to prove the word of God. And then uh, to temperance, patience. We've had to learn to wait on God. We can't get ahead of him. 
we we can't we can't cause anything to happen further than what God is working among us. We can't do our own uh, we can't do our own will. We've got to be patient. We have to we have to be patient in waiting on God, His working among us. Uh, what Paul say, judge nothing until Jesus comes. Until the Lord uh, shows up on the scene, we can't do very much. So we need his help. We need, we need to learn how to follow him all the way through. Okay, but then after, see the priest, after he offered up sacrifices on the altar, then he went to the laver and the laver was lined with women's looking glasses. That was polished brass plates. And that's what women used in those days for mirrors. That was a woman's looking glass. Uh, James, you know, I think used this term, the looking into the perfect law of liberty. Men look into that and then they forget what manner of man they were for the most part. If you're not diligent enough, you'll, you'll forget what you saw. But when you look into this, perfect law of liberty, the word of God that will set you free from sin. The, uh, when you see yourself, that priest, when he looked down in that laver, he saw those women's looking glass. He could see himself. He could war He had to wash himself and get himself ready and change garments. Now there's the part that this next move is, is when we, when we, uh, we have to, continue, you have to add to your patience godliness. Now, this is the garment change. For the priest to be able to go into the holy place, he had to put on a white linen garment, take off his woolen garment, which was a picture of the flesh out in the outer court of the tabernacle. But when, for him to go into the holy place, he had to put on, he had to, there had to be a a clothing change. He had to put on a white linen garment, a cool white linen garment. The reason it was white was because white's a picture of righteousness. And so when you add to your patience, godliness, that is God likeness, that you become God like. And this is the next move. I would say, I'd say this is the move that we're in right now. This is where God, God has brought us through the, I said 1543, but then Pentecost was from, uh, started in 1901 in, in Topeka, Kansas, at Charlie Palms, but it went from there to Houston, Texas, from there, uh, brother, uh, what was the brother's name that, uh, He's right on the tip of my tongue uh, that carried it to Los Angeles, California. He was a, a black minister. He went there and wound up on Azusa Street, opening a little mission there. And there's where God began to pour out the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People came from all around to receive the Holy Ghost. And by 1903, the Holy Ghost was spread, and that's the, that's the, there's four angels. I'll just mention it in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations, and that's in the sixth seal. There were four, uh, yeah, Brother Painter, thank you. It was Brother Seymour uh, that, that went to Los Angeles, California, and uh, by 1903, uh, the 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 Pentecostal movement was established in America. And that was, by the way, from 1543, these angels in the ninth chapter of the book of Revelations, those were four angels loosed out of the river Euphrates. One of them was for a year. That's 360 days, uh, which is a day for a year, which makes it, uh, 360 years from 1543 to 1903. That was the Protestant movement. But then Pentecostalism was established by 1903 in America. And the day, one of those angels were loosed for a day. And that is a hundred years. 
Uh, I show that from 1903 until 1953. That's when the body of Christ had the new experience on the campground where God slayed everybody on the hill up there in between services. Uh, that was, Brother Souders was prophesying that in, in 1952. He died in November of 52. And in, in the campground, the next uh, June in campground, uh, God gave the new experience to the body. Sister, I believe it was Sister Mills that gave out, she was laying in the dirt. She gave out a message in tongues. Brother Molinaw was laying there and he began to interpret. And he said, this is just a drop in the bucket of what I have for my people. And this is to help you uh, in the times ahead. And I've always said, if that was just a drop in the bucket, then we can look forward to the rest of the bucket load in the restored church. So uh, here we have got to add godliness. That's God likeness to be added to our character. We got to become godlike. We can't just be uh, what did it, what did Paul say in 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 uh, Hebrews the sixth chapter verse one. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance and dead works towards God and of the doctrine of baptisms and uh, uh, resurrections, laying on the hands and eternal judgments. And this is what we do if God permit. We've got to go on. We, we, we have to add each one of these things. And one of those angels loosed out of the river Euphrates, this is still talking about restoration, was for a month. That's 30 years. And I have said that we entered into that 30 years. I said 50 years of Jubilee was from 1903 to 1953. But then Ray Leninger was prophesying in 2002 that we should get a, a Jubilee in 2003, 50 years from the new experience. And Brother Leninger thought it was going to be a great move of God a great move of the spirit. And that's what we thought at first. But what happened was, is that God began to heal his body. You know what a Jubilee is? A Jubilee under the law, a Jubilee was every 50 years. And every 50 years, all Hebrew slaves were to be released and given freedom. All debts were to be forgiven. And all inheritance was to be reestablished. And that's what God did in 2003. When God gave us a jubilee, he healed this body. He made it possible for every remnant of separation and division to come back together. And he forgave the debts. We were in debt of our forefathers, that separations that came we were enslaved in the separations of what took place back there. We weren't a part of it, but whatever group we were in, we were in, we were we were enslaved to that. We were in bondage to that. I couldn't leave my group, go to another group. This is the group I came into, and so is the same with every other group. But when God healed us and restored our inheritance in the body of Jesus Christ. That was two 50-year jubilees, and that's 100 years from 1903 until 2003. That's why I say in 2003 started this 30-year angel that came out of the river Euphrates, was loosed, and started a 30-year period of God's restoration, and that's part of this garment change. That's right now God is asking us to be put on godliness, to put on this linen garment. 
God's going to require us to live above sin in righteousness before we can go into the holy place. So you can live above sin and not be perfect. In fact, look, look, Adam, Adam was, he was perfect. He did not sin. He lived above sin until he made a decision to turn against God and sin. But he wasn't perfect, even though he was without sin for the whole time that he lived in the garden without sinning. So you can live in a paradise condition. You can live in paradise. That, that, that's a condition that, and of course, that's the picture that we're, we're fixing to look at, is that you have to add godliness and brotherly kindness. See, if we if we become godlike, we're going to love our brother. Can you imagine dying for your brother? Can you imagine um, Jesus? Jesus, even though while we were still sinners, he died for us. Can you imagine having such the love of God that you'd give your life to save a soul? That that's an understanding. And that's a depth of righteousness that's beyond most people's thinking. So we've got to add here. How did he say it? Add to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. That is the white linen garment. We're in the garment change phase of God's restoration. That's this 30-year period that I've, I've looked at, I'm not trying to be emphatic about the dates, but they do fit from 2003 until 2033 is, is 30 years. If that, if, if that dating would hold true, and we're, we're in 2021, we've got 12 years before the last prophetical hour, which uh, the uh, then we're going into charity, which is the holy place. So here's where the love of God is, the sevenfold light, the unleavened bread. See, we're still eating doctrine that's got leaven in it. It's got leaven is, is yeast in bread that causes it to be puffed up. Unleavened bread. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Be careful for the leaven of the Pharisees. See, we're, we're still eating leaven, but we've got to get to a place in the holy place where we're eating unleavened bread. That, that the table of showbread was unleavened bread. 12 loaves, the, doc, the doctrine of the apostles. There's what we're striving for. That's what God's taking us to. And I think this... You know, what we're going through right now, 2002, and now, I mean, 22, I'm sorry, 2020 and 2021, this epidemic that we're going through. God is, he, you know, this is the beginning of sorrows. And God's getting us ready for a great move. Uh, I, I understand some people think that this is a bad time. And I will say that we have enjoyed the blessings of God on America for these many years because God used this land to restore his church in. But this land, this nation is, has rapidly forgot God. And God will judge this nation before it's over with. And finally, 10 kings will take over after the two-horned beast in Revelations 13 speaks as a dragon and exercises all the power of the beast before it and makes an image to the beast and causes the whole world to worship the image and makes Catholicism the eighth head again. That's going to take place. At the same time, God's going to restore the church and harvest this world. There, there's, a, there's a last prophetical hour coming upon us, and it, it seems like things are happening much faster. And so I'm just trying to give you this to see where God has brought us. God took us through a winter or a drought 
uh, of the Gentile world of the first few, not only the first few hundred years, but when Catholicism was established in AD 325, or really it was given power then, but it wasn't established until 538. And it ruled the world until 1798 when the French general put the Pope in, in prison and ended his rule. And we've not had a dragon power since, but there is a beast, two-horned beast. I'm not going to get into that. It would take too long. I'm out of time, but I, it's eight o'clock and y'all didn't get on here till three and four minutes after. So I'm going to talk for three or four more minutes and let you go <laughs> to get in our full hour. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, take anything away from you. I don't want to be skimpy about this. <laughs> anyway, uh, so <clears throat> God is, uh, but these types are beautiful types showing how the, the phases of restoration that God's worked it with, I could... Uh, being the early church and then in AD 78, a hundred years would be AD one. A Pentecostal type error, they had lost uh, the, the white horse effect, it went into the red horse. These are backward phases. We got to go back through, you know, the, uh, oh, it was white horse, then red horse, then uh, a, a, a black horse and then a pale horse. Well, we had to come out, you see, for a hundred years, it was a Pentecostal era from AD 78. I know it, it, AD 70 was the judgment, but it didn't happen overnight. It took a seven and a half year, half hour period, uh, prophetical period from AD 33 and a half to AD 77 or 78, seven and a half years to 33 and a half is AD 78. That finished the White Horse era. And then 100 years to that's 178. And then your 360 years to that takes you to 538, which is a Protestant type era. And then, um, and so that took us to the, to the Pale Horse. Well, we come out of the Pale Horse death into uh, darkness the black horse, Protestantism, then the red horse, Pentecostalism, and now we're heading back into the white horse. God's gonna take us back into the white horse. Jesus in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation was on a white horse and they that followed him was on white horses. Oh God, I've got my money on the white horse. How about you? I, I, th I know who's gonna win this race. It's the white horse. Anyway, so God bless your hearts tonight. I just wanted to give you these types, these phases of the restoration of the church. Now, let me stop for a minute and say a couple things. Number one, uh, we're having a work day Saturday uh, at the church. Uh, Brother Durham is going to replace, I think, he and Brother Matthew and some of the men helping us five of our older commodes that are in the church with new modern day commodes in the, in the dining room, primarily uh, those bathrooms down there, the ones upstairs were replaced already. Uh, then I'd like to say something about this, this here Facebook live broadcast. I would really like for some of y'all to consider maybe us doing this on Zoom meeting, having a Zoom meeting on Thursday nights where we can see one another. Uh, it's it's a little bit more of a togetherness. Um, anyway, I, I think we can do it. I just want you to be thinking about that and tell me what you think about it. Uh, I'm having Zoom meetings right now on Monday nights with the Dominican Republic and uh, some down in South Texas and, and all. And so uh, if y'all, uh, I mean, any, you're invited to get on the Monday night Zoom meetings that start at six o'clock. 
The reason I started at six is because it is, um, it's eight o'clock in the Dominican Republic when it's six o'clock here. So we have it at six because I, those Zoom meetings a lot of times last two hours and that takes them to 10 o'clock at night by the time it's finished. So uh, of course, Brother Emilio Green or somebody interprets for me in Spanish. So I just wanted to uh, give you, uh, I, I thought uh, I would just mention uh, that if anyone that wants to get on our six o'clock meeting, uh, Zoom meeting, and I understand that's early for some uh, here that might even hardly be get, you know, hardly get home from work uh, by then and have supper. But if you want to get on it, let me know and I'll send you the ID. You can text me. My text number is right up there at the top. And uh, if you want to text me and, and request the ID for Monday night Zoom meeting, you, you'll have to have Zoom. You can download the app on your phone. You, you can broadcast it to your TV. If you have a TV that you can do that to, you can have it on a tablet, iPad, or on your computer. Uh, you can have the app on Windows app, Zoom, uh, Android app, or uh, uh, Apple app on any Apple. You know, so you can get on the Zoom app and you can get on that. If you'd like to be a part of that, let me know and uh, I'll send you the ID. I also would like to have some input and response to what you think about having a Zoom this meeting. I don't know. I need to find out if there's a way we can broadcast it live uh, as well. But if you've never been on a Zoom meeting, they are interesting and it's more of a together. You can see everybody. You can see one another. Uh, you can turn your video off if you're not presentable, but surely to goodness, you could at least look presentable without having to get dressed uh, to go to church since we're not, you know, we're, you're staying at home. You surely look presentable enough to be in a zoom meeting once a week. Uh, but you can turn your video off for some reason that, you know, you're sick or whatever, and you need to, you don't want your video on. You can turn that off and still see everybody else. And you can even talk. People can ask questions. You know, we can have a host for it and, and so forth. So anyway, um, wanted to mention that now, just for in closing with prayer, uh, request sister, where are you at sister Ann? I thought I saw you on here a minute ago. Yeah. Aunt Lois Estrada, that's sister Ann. She is in Indiana with her sister and, um, she is in Indiana. Family here needs prayer. Sisters have back surgery the 11th of February. She's asking us to pray for her. So let's remember that. Um, let's see. Sister Sister Margaret Weiser in McAllister, Oklahoma, passed away with COVID. Brother Weiser's wife there in, in uh, Seoul. Let's remember that. Um Okay, Brother Terry, I didn't even know you was on here. Uh, that's that's uh, from uh, Keswick, Canada, Brother Goss's assembly, Brother Terry and Sister Angela's wife. Uh, okay, Sister Terry Durham said, there is a way because Mount Carmel was a Zoom meeting. That was a youth meeting, uh, and it was on Facebook. So... I, it can be posted on Facebook, I believe, but I don't know if it can go live at the same time. That's what I'm wanting to find out. But anyway, uh, I'd like to get some replies. Uh, text me. And let me know if you'd like for us to try the Zoom meeting. I will uh, uh, I will uh, I'll look into it and see if we can do it. We may try it, but I'd like to have some of your 
Brother Potus from Philippines. God bless your heart, Brother Potus. I, I saw you was on here tonight and I meant to say something to you. God bless your heart. It's good to have you. We appreciate having you in service with us. Um, Brother Adams, God bless you, Brother Albert Adams. I love that brother. He's a good pastor. And um, All right, let's see. Any other prayer request? Let's remember the body of Jesus Christ. We've lost some really good people with this pandemic. Uh, you see, if we were on Zoom right now, we'd just all turn our microphones on where we could hear one another and pray and ask God to meet these needs. I realize I went over a little bit today, so I'm going to pray with me right now, if you would. God bless your hearts. Precious Lord, oh God, touch this ministry in the body of Christ. Uh, help us, oh God, direct our steps. Help us during this time. We know you're in charge of everything. Our trust is in you. Oh God, give us the fear and the respect, the reverence that we need for you, which your servant Job said it is wisdom to fear God and understanding is to depart from evil. God, touch your people. Touch this family in Indiana, Sister Estrada's family, the sister that's going to have back surgery. Touch Brother Weiser in the church in McAllister, Oklahoma, with this loss of Sister Margaret Weiser. God, comfort Brother Weiser's heart and the family uh, tonight and during this time as they adjust to this loss. Oh, God, watch your people. Touch over uh, watch over us and touch us, Lord, and help us, God, to follow your leading. Oh, God, reveal to your ministry what the Spirit is saying to the church uh, at this time. Our trust is in you. You're our help in the time of present need. You're our shield and our buckler. Our trust and our faith is in you, Savior. In Christ's name, we, we give you praise. We thank you for your goodness to us. God bless all of you tonight. I appreciate each and every one of you. I'm trying to look to see if there's anything else I needed to say. Um, Sister Janique, praise God. Uh, she made it back, I believe, in town. Should be in church Sunday. I'm looking forward. She's been traveling out of town a lot lately, and I, I miss her. I miss all of God's people that can't make it right now. Uh, all right. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. I'll see the locals here uh, Sunday morning, breakfast at 9.30, Bible study at 10 o'clock in the Little Rock Church, service upstairs at 11.30. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I just wanted to, uh, I'll mention, uh, I wanted to I'll mention again, work day, Saturday morning at eight o'clock. You brethren that can come and help out, we sure do appreciate it. We got a great work group of men that are very faithful to work in the church. So we've got several things to do uh, Saturday. We've been having to work here lately. So, okay, Brother Sean Whalen would appreciate, uh, would participate in a Zoom meeting from California. All right, God bless your hearts. Uh, Sister Heidi Day has an unspoken need that I didn't mention. Uh, Brother Leah Ciprian from the Dominican Republic's on here. Sister Betty Layton, God bless your heart, Sister Betty. I imagine Tansy, her, her, her daughter's probably on there too. That Lahali is in Haverhill with Brother Rivera. I think I uh, mentioned him early. But anyway, it's good to have you on here with us. All right. God bless your hearts. We love all of you. Have a good night. Pray for me. 
and I'll pray for you. See you Sunday morning, local. First Gospel.